been long been on record as um, thinking that, you know, um, a mathematical or engineering solution to marketing will like never, ever be found. The Wanamaker problem, you know, which is half my advertising spend is being wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half that problem will never be fully solved. Uh, uh, you know, marketers will make incremental pro pro progress against it, but then the world will change and the problem will kind of uh, spring up from its own ashes, as it were. Welcome to What Gets Measured, a NinjaCat podcast about marketing performance management, metrics, and effectiveness. Because what gets measured gets managed. I'm your host, Jake Sanders. As head of innovation and insights at U of Digital, Miles Younger leads new product development, tech services, and thought leadership to help scale the company's educational offerings to new formats, new learners, and new markets. Miles's nearly 20-year career in advertising has spanned every facet of the business, from his time in client-side marketing, experience as an ad tech founder and product leader, to his experience inside the world of agencies and consulting. Miles is a regular contributor to industry publications such as Adweek, Ad Exchanger, and Ad Monsters. He's a joy to follow on Twitter, and he's here today to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in ad tech. Miles, welcome to the show. Hey, Jake. Thanks a lot for having me on, man. Thank you for being here. Uh, well, I figure we should just start with a brief bio of your career. I, I listed a lot of things, but there's probably more. Uh, how, how'd you get your start in advertising and how did you end up in your current role at U of digital? Yeah. Yeah. The, the brief part of the brief bio is also always the hardest, hardest <laughs> part to hit. Um, yep. <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll start with like the ad tech founder thing. Cause that was kind of how I fell into what well, ad tech I, I, I fell into ad tech without knowing or intending to fall into ad tech. Uh, uh, me and a couple of buddies started a company that started out as like this um, templated display ad builder thing in we started working on it in like 2008 and that was actually a pretty novel concept at the time which seems unbelievable now um, um, and that morphed into a dynamic ad platform that you know uh, supported a lot of like uh, product level remarketing campaigns for like uh, online stores and stuff like that and so like that that's how I ended up in um, ad tech and i eventually uh wound that company down in 2017 um and i went to join um uh relatively small at least at the time a uh, programmatic consultancy called mighty hive and that was what kind of got me into the agency world and and um i i met uh you mentioned me being on twitter probably too much but i i met the founder <laughs> of of you of digital on twitter believe it or not, uh, Shiv Gupta, he and I met uh, on Twitter um, during the pandemic and and kind of uh, struck up a relationship. And um, he approached me, I don't know, at this point, probably a good year and a half ago, at least, uh, to to join U of Digital. And, and U of Digital is a training and education company for the ad tech and MarTech industry and digital media industry. And um, I had kind of become a part-time explainer guy inside of Media Monks, which was the agency and consultancy that I was at most recently prior to U of Digital. And, and that was kind of one of the things that just brought me over to U of Digital was having this front row seat to, you know, being inside of an organization that did a lot of things and being exposed to a lot of people inside of the company that I worked with and then externally at clients and partners who just had a tremendous need to have things explained to them. And, uh, you know, me being an explainer guy, kind of like having the experience of like, well, I, I can't personally explain topic X to all these people. Like I, I have a day job. There's only so many hours in my day. And, and <laughs> right. uh, so anyway, so that was just kind of partly what sort of, uh, clued me into the fact that U of Digital was really onto something because I was personally experiencing the alternative approach, the kind of ad hoc approach to that problem. So anyway, that's right. kind of how I ended up at U of Digital. I, I kind of, I've always been kind of a explainer guy at heart and U of Digital <laughs> was a, was a, well, is a company that that's all they do. That's all we yeah. do is, is, is explain things. Well, and it's fascinating to, because uh, I I found you on Twitter and, and I just kept on, you know, you're very funny. Uh, you have this kind of wit about oh, you. Oh, stop. But, oh, stop, Jake. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I won't. 
Um, no, but you, but you, you have a core of um, knowledge that you're willing. It seems like you know so much to the point that you're willing to have fun with the information. And I think yeah. that's what a lot of people don't want to do. They want to seem very businessy upfront, but you kind of mix all your stuff together. And that's, I mean, if you're an, you're more than just an explainer guy, is what I'm trying to say. No, that this is really kind of you. Yeah, I mean, you know, on the one hand, you know, um, a spoonful of sugar helps the explanation go down. I suppose, <laughs> like, right. you know, people are more likely to sort of pay attention and understand what you're saying if if you're, you know, maybe trying to be humorous or a, a little bit unexpected. But yeah, you know, it's also like, boy, without the humor. How boring would all of our jobs be? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and that's that's one of the things you're just very comfortable with the way yeah. you get into things, and and uh, it's a benefit to the people that you have digital uh, and all the people that you're serving. But I think it's important because there are so many tactics, but there is a strategic piece that's missing. We we hear all about the tactics, you know, like there's new tech, new abilities, new capabilities, all those things. But most people don't drill into the strategic importance or why you should even do that stuff. Yeah. And I mean, if we, if we look at the loom escape, you know, Scott Brinker has, has created, which is like, there's, there's just so many opportunities or platforms or middlemen, or who knows how to explain that in a way that makes everybody not feel bad, <laughs> but there are a ton of things out there in the, in the landscape. And I, I kind of, I just want to get your thoughts, like an overview of the current landscape in ad tech and what, what you think the hills and valleys marketers are facing yeah. today. So, well, firstly, uh, not to correct you, but, uh, Lumascape is, uh, Luma partners, Terry oh. Kawaja's thing. Uh, oh, here he goes. Scott Explainer Brinker. guy. Explainer He's... guy strikes again. Scott, Scott Brinker <laughs> is uh, chief Martech. That's the, I think the right. Martech landscape. I think is what it's called. That's the one. And that one just hit. That one just hit eleven thousand companies. He just put out the most recent one a few months ago, I believe. Uh, so it's it's pretty fresh, as it were. Um, yes. <laughs> and that that one just hit eleven thousand companies. And so, like the hills and valleys with like Mar Martech and AdTech is. It's just the sheer complexity of it all. Like, so you have digital sees the, um, I don't know what people are just confused by that, those landscapes. Absolutely. Uh, um, yes. The, the, the Lumascape side and, you know, and, and the, the cheap MarTech thing, uh, people are confused by it, but then also having to actually use any of that tech and, and string it together is incredibly difficult. And like, I'm kind of astonished that at least in the MarTech landscape, like that industry is still like, growing in terms of the number of companies. I, I have to think at some point it will sort of stall out. Uh, it's it's right. definitely like ad tech, for instance, is I think you'd have to ask Terry Kawaja. He'd actually have numbers on this. Um, I mean, whatever. He's on Twitter. So it's a whatever. Go search his Twitter feed or hit him up. Or, I hit him up on Twitter. He'll probably share the the info. Um, but ad tech, I think, is shrinking in terms of the number of companies at this point. Like it sort of peaked. I don't know when it peaked five, 10 years ago in terms of sheer number of companies. And then it's been undergoing this process of consolidation. But MarTech, on the other hand, is just continues to explode and explode. And, and that is, uh, you know, also from my time in consulting, it felt like that was essentially driving a lot of the demand for consulting services was the fact that marketers are just kind of like overwhelmed putting together more and more Lego blocks. Like they just can't handle it. But then I guess if, if I'm going to pivot over to sort of like the plus side, it's also a lot of it is just much more advanced than it, than it used to be. Cause I, I, I haven't been on the client side of marketing for like in earnest, I guess, for like 15 or so years now. Mm. And so like my experience predated, it predated like what is like commonly known as marketing automation now. So like, you know, probably 9,000 of those 11,000 companies on the chief MarTech landscape, just not, not only did the companies not exist, but just the entire concepts that they represented didn't exist. And like, uh, you know, I didn't have the benefit of any of those tools. And so it's actually kind of fun 
right now inside of you of digital, you know, we're busy standing up all kinds of systems internally as we grow and mature as a company. And right. for me, it's actually my sort of first time getting to mess with some of this tech and it's like really cool and it's very easy to use. And I don't need to, like, I've written a lot of code in my day, but I don't want to like reteach myself how to code. I don't want to spend time coding. I don't have time for it. And there's all this stuff you can do now without coding. Like, you're just like, okay, I'm just going to hit some buttons. And this thing I want is just going to like spring forth into existence. And I, that's just like a real sort of breath of fresh air to me. And I would imagine a lot of marketers. Yeah. And I mean, like, what, what are some of those examples of those things that you were playing around with that you were like, whoa. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm playing around with some uh, no code application development. Uh, I don't even know which platforms, I guess. I, I hate to say like no code application development applications. So I, I guess I have to say platform. <laughs> That's uh, fine. <laughs> and those are so cool because like, again, like, I, so being an ad tech founder, like I, I had to scratch build virtually everything that I did partly out of ignorance because I'm not a developer by trade. And so if you are a developer by trade, you know, all the shortcuts, I didn't know any of the shortcuts. So I was having to scratch build all this stuff. And so being able to build a little miniature software application that runs on a little, you know, miniature database on the back end without having to literally without having to write a line of code is pretty incredible and saves a ton of time. Yeah. Uh, and so I, that's just been one of the things that I've been, I've been messing with. Lately. Yeah. And then, and then, I, and so the plus side is that there's, sort of no coding, easy to use, accessible things. You don't have to like know a bunch of, you know, advanced concepts to get these things off the ground. But on the con side, it's learning how to stitch all this stuff together, like the Franken stack. Like, like you're going to have to have a, a stack of things to make it work. I mean, do, do you think the idea of having a single source for truth or one, like, god application or god platform is that sort of um is that a, a sort of el dorado that we shouldn't be looking for or do, how, how do you embrace the stack do you think you know i i love the el dorado uh analogy I, yeah i, I don't just... know it's it's great um well because these things really they take on this kind of like mystical quality and pretty soon we're sort of like out questing for a thing that we've been told we're supposed to quest for, but we stopped questioning the quest. Um, oh. is, I, I'm just, wow, I'm on That's fire dope. today, aren't I? That yeah. was dope. Bars. Miles you, has yeah, bars. Can, can you put like a beat under that when you <laughs> publish that? We can, we can turn this into like a coffee house. These things, they take on this kind of like mystical quality. And pretty soon we're sort of like out questing for a thing that we've been told we're supposed to quest for, but we stopped questioning the quest. It's kind of a slam poetry thing on yeah, ad tech here. So I'm kind of pumped like by it. I'm like snapping. Well, this is great. I'll have yeah. another mocha. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, uh, <laughs> the Eldorado thing, the, the unified uh, uh, sort of sort of the truth. I don't yeah, think yeah, it's yeah. so much that like everybody should stop looking for it because you can always kind of uh, uh, simplify things a little bit more, or unify things a little bit more. And then you also always have to be pushing against the opposite uh, of it, which is just total sprawl, chaos, you know, disunity. You always have to be pushing against that. And so that's where I think a lot of the, 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 the quests value is, is simply pushing against chaos and, and entropy as it were. But yeah. no, I don't, I, I, I am, um, you know, I've been long been on record as, um, thinking that, you know, um, a whatever mathematical or engineering solution to marketing will like never ever be found the um the wanna maker problem you know which is half my advertising spend is being wasted the trouble is i don't know which half that problem will never be fully solved uh, uh you know marketers will make incremental pro pro 
progress against it, but then the world will change and the problem will kind of uh, spring up from its own ashes, as it were. Um, so no, I, 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 I think, but I do think, you know, actually another part of your question was like, okay, dealing with the marketer stack com- complexity. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, so you know, again, this is something like you have digital is dealing with right now as the company mm-hmm. grows. It's like, well, how many technology solutions do we really want or need to accomplish uh, the goal? And the thing with like um, one of the big downsides with like software as a service and downside of this software getting easier and easier to sign up for because they make it frictionless to sign up for it. You can start using almost any application in the world for free. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, like enterprise grade, top notch stuff. You can go in and start using, you know, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, the HubSpot, Salesforce, whatever. They'll all give you some little credits or whatever to start using the thing for free, unlock most of the good features for free um, and start using the thing. And before you know it, you know, you've kind of like you had uh, some micro need in your stack of like, well, I really wish I could do this one little thing. Oh, I'm going to go and Google it. And I'm going to look at a couple, you know, SaaS applications and I sign up for one and it accomplishes the thing that I needed to accomplish. But then all of a sudden I've added to like the bloat of my software stack Uh without really thinking about it because these companies made it so easy to sign up for and use these services. So that's another aspect of like, well, yeah, MarTech is much easier to use these days, but you know, you got to be really careful with that because you know, you it's it's sort of like owning a house and filling up your garage and your attic and your basement with stuff. It's like you just <laughs> your your marketing stack expands to fill the you know sort space. of like the space that you're giving it. And if that I went in, I don't know. That, I no, I I analogy. really you know what I'm lo- saying. But I, I I love that concept is is you said something interesting and I wrote getting lean and focused with your offering and like sort of your main bread and butter is a great way to help reduce that complexity. You know, like yeah. you you if you're just micro needs and you know, signing up for free trials, that's how the Frankenstack gets created. It's not that people go at it wanting to create complex things, but no. maybe they need to get focused on their core offerings, which, which what you were talking about, it's interesting that you of digital is having that question is like, what, what do we really want to focus on? And then yeah. maybe that'll help you align yep. the tactics you choose to, to set forth. Well, well yeah, that, I mean, that's another thing is, is any marketer, any company that's building out an application stack. That's another thing that, that I, I keep talking about these SaaS applications. Like they're sort of like some rules that are like looming. They, they, them. um, <laughs> them, but I'm going to continue referring to them as they, but Perfectly they also, fine. they also, um, dangle some really attractive carrots because you, you have, let's say that you want your marketing stack or your application stack to do A, B, and C. And so on Monday, you're like, okay, we're going to build a stack that does A, B, and C. Then on Tuesday and Wednesday, you start Googling solutions to build out your ABC stack. And by Friday, you come back to your teammates and you're like, guys, I found a stack that does A, B, and C, but they also do D and they do E and F and G and they do H and I found this other stack that does I and J and like pretty soon, like you just, you, you now again, your appetite has sort of expanded to, to fill what like to meet these, these offerings that like you didn't even know that you wanted. And now you're probably going back and kind of justifying the need because you're like, well, we need D E and F now that I've seen it. I need it, you know. <laughs> and it's again, it's it's there's there's some really interesting psychology at play, and yes. these 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 SaaS offerings have spent the last you know 15 years or so really getting good at enticing people and drawing them into this like sort of like slot machine pachinko game like dazzling hall of features that it's like (laughs) oh don't you want all this stuff uh you know all you have to do is sign up and then upgrade and you could have all this can be yours too and uh you know there's just there's anyway interesting psychology at play 
Yes. No, I and and it's interesting that psychology is at the root of these things. It's a very technological problem. It's very complex. Uh, there's a bunch of interacting uh, integrations and you know interfaces and you know all those things. But at the core, there's yeah. a psychological underpinning of thinking. Well, they have something. I want that. Yeah. We need that. And then oh yeah. oh, then we need this. Then we need this. Then we need this. And and it's just it's interesting that the ad tech landscape is complicated not because of the stuff but because of the people. I, I think that's kind of fascinating, interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 two sides because, like, you know, it's the the SaaS application developers. I mean, they're like the drug pushers and the users are the addicts, and it's just <laughs> neither could exist without the other. Oh, like, oh, they, gosh. They just form. It's an awful. You should probably edit that out. That's a horrible analogy. I Everybody think it's a new Jack. Like, it's a new Jack City <laughs> reference, and we will keep it. Marketers are pooky. <laughs> Somewhere in a you know a crushed up you know apartment complex, just like shaking and yeah. sweating because you don't know it, what you're missing, it, and then you get a taste that free trial. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. It's so it, it's a total. There's a total symbiosis. Uh, uh, it is uh, that yeah. Marketers kind of well, just people. It's not just marketers, not just Apple. You know, and people are sort of compulsive. They don't you know. Once you show them a shiny object, they want the shiny object and they'll figure out a way to either get it and sort of justify it and and rationalize it and all that kind of stuff. And yes, at the end of the day, one of the side effects is that marketers end up with like these overly complex stacks. Right. You know, and and then at the end, when the CMO at the end of their 18 month tenure, thank you so much for your service. They're going to be let go because what did you do? What did you really do? We gave you a bunch of budget. You got a whole bunch of stuff. And then the new CMO comes on and says, we're getting rid of all these legacy things. We're going lean. And then they end up finding new A, B, C, D, E, Fs. And then the per it just keeps going. You know, I can just see that. Like, Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other topic of just kind of like, I, I, and I don't, I don't necessarily know the answer of like, what went wrong with marketing that, you know, CMOs or marketing leaders now have apparently such short, sort of ill-fated tenures. I don't, it just, it makes very little sense to me. Well, and um, I think it's, it's, it's the return on investment. It's, it's documentation. It's, it's proof of concept. It's, you know, KPIs, OKRs. We could definitely go off on that. But to your earlier point about shiny objects, the latest shiny object is AI. Everyone's mm. talking about it. Um, you know, some recent post was like, not everybody's using ChatGPT. Uh, you guys are saying that we're all using it and very small amounts of people are using it. And <laughs> it seems like that's interesting. Something I learned on Twitter, which is very small. And I was like, everybody's talking about it on Twitter. You talk to anyone who doesn't have a Twitter account, they have no right. idea what you're talking yeah, yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so AI is this new thing. Um, if you could put on your little, your little hat, you know, and get your crystal ball out. Where, what, what effects do you think this will have on advertising analytics and creativity? You know, let's just open up the AI uh, Pandora's well, box. Well, why don't we talk about analytics first, and uh, then we talk about creativity? Because I, I, that's one where I want to get your your thoughts. I, re I sure. really, I really do. I want to get into yeah. that. Uh, no, let's do it. The analytics one is is really interesting. I actually have to borrow an idea that I got from. Uh, Simon Poulton, uh, who is also on uh, on on Twitter, really nice guy, very very smart. Is is he made the point about analytics? Is like so currently, if you want to run a particular analysis on a particular data set, you often need, and I'm saying you, so let's say sort of a non technical person needs the help of. A technical person, uh, a, a data scientist, uh, somebody who knows SQL, somebody who literally knows where the data table is and how to access it. Because you might say, well, I think this data set is out there somewhere, but I, I literally don't know where it is or how to access right, it. Right, right. Because it's not, it's not on Google Drive, so uh, I'm, I need somebody else's help here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, you know, AI may really... Um, I, I'm not saying it's going to put all of the, uh, you know, data scientists or whatever out of out of a job, but it could really democratize a lot of analytics where you, the AI becomes your data scientist. So it's the same questions that you're 
currently putting either to your in-house data science stakeholder partner colleague or an external agency or consultancy that you're um, that you're working with the same questions that you put to them over email or something or slack or whatever it is right. or a, yeah. a, a phone call or a video call or whatever right pretty soon you're just going to be able to put those to an ai agent you don't even need to rephrase them i mean you just put it to them the same way you would have would have put it to a human mm-hmm. and they will go find the answer to the question and so um um it's just i think really going to change a lot of analytics in that way that that currently there's just a lot of sort of like these these very laborious manual steps to get to the answer that you need right that currently you can or but you know in the not too distant future you'll just be able to put it to a, a an ai agent i think it's that's a really interesting area as far as i'm concerned of, of absolutely analytics just being able to get to the answer you want sort of just faster and easier because you no longer need to get the time of a human who has very limited time in their day. There's just an AI agent you can ask and they have all the time in the world. You don't have to, you don't pay them. You, you know, they just exist to answer your questions. And I think just that that's going to have a, a, a pretty big impact on, on marketing analytics. Well, and data visualization too. You, you just say, yeah. take this data set and show yeah. me this line yeah. chart, show me this bar graph, show me this, uh, you know, whatever it is. Um, you, yeah. it's, it's ve- that stuff is happening now. So, yeah. you know, that future mm-hmm. vision is sort of like, um, next Tuesday <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> rather than and, like and, five to 10 years off, you know, when we were supposed to get flying cars, we still don't have flying cars, no flying cars, but I, I don't know. We could, you could, yeah, it'll probably get to the point that you'll just be able to ask one of these, uh, large language models, like, you know, please uh give me you know the complete specifications for a flying car and they just will it'll just come back you'll just get a good bunch of blueprints and like whoa, I, whoa why did we that's a plane like, this is a was, plane yeah yeah this is a plane um oh well what i was going to say about the visualization thing is um you know that's an area where i can easily see these ai agents um doing a far better job than people i mean we've all had the colleague who just is absolutely awful at building sort of like, you know, the presentation deck with the chart and you're just like, Oh my God, like, you know, uh, what uh, anyway, um, uh, people are just very (laughs) bad, very bad at making charts. And uh, I think that's an area where AIs are going to come back and like have these really beautiful charts that we're just going to be, you know, it's going to be like the New York times level of, graphics right um again just at your fingertips like you no longer need to uh take the spreadsheet output and format your own awful chart you just ask the ai and they send you back this like absolutely beautiful uh visual of whatever you know the answer to the question you were asking well and so and then to pivot to the creativity uh conversation you know it's interesting that you have experience with dynamic ad insertion um you know, you, you, what, what you were doing at your previous uh, company was yep. using data, using information from retargeting, and then creating a specific new piece of creative to fly out, you know, in some kind of programmatic, uh, you know, ad interface or, you know, distribution point. And so yep. it's, it's kind of interesting that the things that we're really excited about, you know, um, AI will help you create a hundred thousand ads and every it'll have everybody's name and you and it'll have their location and you're like i can do that right now you know but it'll just happen faster (laughs) or like you know creativity has been there you know uh automated creativity but also just automated creativity i mean am i throwing up in my mouth i could be throwing (laughs) up in your mouth uh, we could both oh, be throwing up, and oh my a, god! Now I have to delete a, most, all of this podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I have to say I I think that the automated creative thing, in terms of like the performance benefits that you would get out of it in a campaign, at this point might be minimal, just because we've already sort of pushed the limits on how many different creatives you can traffic into a campaign that will help you zero in on what it is that your audience uh, is really going to respond to. 
I think there's yes. there's a lot of benefits in terms of uh, streamlining the workflow and the uh, lowering your cost, your production cost. These are all sort of like ad agency operational questions um, that are very interesting to ad agency people and also very interesting to clients because they can reduce their agency cost. But I think once those creatives are done and trafficked into campaigns, I would be skeptical that they're going to have a tremendous impact on performance because we we collectively have, as an industry have had the ability to micro personalize and micro segment and uh, scale out production to you know a thousand ten thousand a million creative versions we've had that ability for a, a long time now it's that is old news and I'm not sure that there's a ton of incremental sort of juice left there in terms of campaign performance. Right. Uh, not not to mention the, the creative. I think you're just going to like sort of uh, your creative is just going to tend towards some sort of vanilla thing that, you, again, is just it's not going to it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, I, I, you know, and so. Well, and I, anyway, I, I was just writing down and just like what you said, you know, yeah. uh, earlier, you're saying, well, we got ABC problem. Well, I found an ABC. We also got DF. Also, this other people do G. And then I'm thinking of AB testing is that, yeah. well, we'll create an ad and we'll AB, you know, a color, you know, or a different, you know, headline or something. But you could AZ test um, uh, uh, like uh, maybe, I don't know how. A omega test, you know, all these things, and you could create thousands of different iterations. One, it's going to be hard to keep track of the production of those things. Two, it's going to be hard to be uh, in charge of the distribution points. Three, you're going to be, I now have a problem of attribution. And then four, <laughs> you know, you're just going to be like, well, I, I think what you mentioned was that it will just reduce itself down to a homogenized khaki pair of pleated chinos you know <laughs> where like no one's gonna be offended by my pant choice you know but did you say <laughs> something cool with your pants you know i mean like maybe your brand needs to walk out with mc hammer pants you know and you just are walking around here with chinos you know like yeah i i think that might be the end result of all of that well so this is the question i have for you <clears throat> hmm. so like so if you think about it, AI as a creative tool, the most yeah. recent in a long line of even just specifically digital creative tools. So right. you take the last, I don't know, how long have we had digital creative tools? Maybe around 50, 60 years, you go back to the original like synthesizers. Right. You know, I, we've had digital creative tools for a long time. And right. so it's like they make a certain ingredient to your final creative output easier so you take like um, something like adobe illustrator or photoshop now i don't need i don't need to go out and buy pens and paper and paints and chalk and pencils and all that kind of stuff i can just like fire up my computer and i can start making visuals you know mm -hmm. uh the visuals i make are kind of up to me except now you can feed them into like an ai generator but like like way how like how do you conceive of music that way of like there's been a this long progression of this like you know you're a musician there's this long progression of like muse the music industry or, or 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 the act of like making music has more and more digital tools added to it um and these sort of these things that get you to where you need to go faster and they on the one hand it's very homogenizing but on the other hand music hasn't died hopefully it never will like how do you what do you think that balance is so and this this is this is where i think advertisers and marketers get get way into their own uh bag uh where they don't see themselves as cultural participants sure like you're you're putting out ads that will become a part of the cultural conversation you know yep. like snuggies I don't know if anybody remembers Snuggies, but it was basically like this blanket you could wear. Um, and then like, we're laughing about it and you're like, oh my God, no. And then you see them everywhere. And then you're like, wait a minute. And then everyone has a Snuggie. 
And yeah. so it's it's this weird dynamic interchange in between the individual and then the community. And I think advertisers and marketers are really focused on this individualization of things. We're going to personalize things. We're going to do this, but they're missing <laughs> they're missing out on this community aspect, which is what you're supposed to be doing, talking to the marketplace. So I think in regards to music, it's very interesting because maybe 10 years ago, like everything had a ukulele and then everything had whistles, you know, in it. Uh -huh. I was like, what is going on? Like, why, why are we into the ukulele all of a sudden? And then, um, you know, before that, you know, you have monster ballads, like huge, great 16 layer choruses and, and things like that. So I think the, the, your, the community itself of people, the audience tells you what to create. Yep. And you listen to it and you say, well, if you want something that sounds like Philip Glass or you want something that sounds like Aunt Zimmer or you want something that sounds like, you know, uh, you know, blues or rock or something, you have those examples to play with. But I think what you mentioned earlier was that in advertising, I can skip over this idea of drafting and pencils and, you know, th those things. And I can skip over the physical work of experiencing frustration and failure and i can just get to the product and i think it's going to reduce people's uh capacity or um tendency to be frustrated yeah and i think that's interesting i think really convenience is this thing that ends up creating that homogenization and it's only because we listen to what you want you know well well, well we yeah. just followed what you guys like and then all of a sudden Every brand has non-serif font, you know, and now we're kind of kicking back, you know, Burberry's latest rebrand is they, they brought back the horse. They brought back this color, this beautiful kind of typography. I think there will be always um, the tools and techniques that create this market ready stuff. And then there will always be a swing where somebody's yeah. taking that, putting it on their head, or, you know, taking this existing, you know, like dance music, like basically any music from 2000 on is, is really influenced by dance. Before that, it was hip hop. Before that, it was rock, you know, and it's interesting to see how people are using the, the templates that people are comfortable with and pushing, pushing against the edge. And I think humans are always going to be pushing the edge but automated technique is always going to be looking at the outputs and hoping that they give something that you like. I hope you like this. And, yeah. you know, I think you've got to ride that dynamic interchange, but you always have to be able to push through with a human hand. Yeah. And if we can give more respect to the human hand, um, then maybe you'll make something that's distinguished. I mean, I just read something in Marketing Week. 15% of brand campaigns are non-distinctive. Uh, wait, no, there's only 15% of brand campaigns are distinctive. The rest are, distinctive, are not yeah. distinctive. So yeah. you're looking at like, <laughs> I don't know what the number is, 85? Um, yeah. Everything looks the same. Y'all are using purple. Everyone's using yeah. this font. Everyone has this, you know, kind of clever, little witty response, you know, putting emojis and stuff. Um, it's interesting to note that we're still struggling to make distinguished uh, interesting, unique things. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. This this tool is supposed to give us the ability to do that, but it it's only fed by what we give it. So you're only going to get what you got, and you're not going to go to anywhere new. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting of like the idea that like AI tools essentially as a path to getting to the non-distinct thing faster. It's just like, well, did you want a more efficient way to be non-distinct? Here right, you go. Oh boy, have we Here's... got something for you? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I mean, I, I like your point about, about, um, uh, sorry, I've had a cold. I don't know if my voice don't sounds really weird down. Right It now. could be allergy. Who knows? We don't yeah. know. Don't, don't tell us too much. Uh, this is a uh, HIPAA violation free podcast. <laughs> I don't want to hear anything about your health, Miles. No, your comment about, uh, experiencing frustration mm -hmm. from the, the creative process and say, you know, doing things by hand or doing things the old fashioned way or doing this things in some non-optimal way is partly frustrating. And it might not be frustrating in the sense that it makes you angry. You just end up with and running into a lot of creative dead end. 
Like sure. for every thousand dead ends you run into, some of which may only take you five seconds. And you're just like, oh, that's a little dead end. And you go back and you, you know, you start over and, and you eventually reach something that either you like or like you said, the community likes it, whatever. You reach something right. that's good. Yeah. But you, you <laughs> there's a there's a very sort of like long and one way you could describe it is frustrating process to get to that. And when when you take all the frustration out of it, you do lose a lot of opportunity for the creative process to even happen in the first place. It's like Mm -hmm. you're actually by removing all of like, you know, well, now I don't need to go find a pad of paper. Now I don't even need to learn how to draw. I I don't really need to put any sort of sweat and toil into this thing. And I can just get right to the output. I could just start doing my layout or whatever it is. Right. And you you think you know we sort of have been trained to think that that is the creative process me being in adobe illustrator moving shapes around on a screen is the creative process like actually no all of that sweat and toil that you skipped over that was the creative process the Mm -hmm. the tail end of it of just putting the final like okay now i know what i need to do that's got to go there that's got to go there that's got to go there bam i'm done that was just your your absolute final finishing touch on the whole process. The rest of it, uh, all the stuff, you know, the uh, 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 and everything that ended up on the cutting room floor, all the crumpled up pieces of paper in your waste basket or whatever it is, or, or you know, whatever MP3 files you're going to delete because they just suck. Yeah, version you know? two point four yeah, to yeah, two point yeah. nine to two point three. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, that was your creative process. So, so I, I just, it, it is interesting how AI, you know, it, it's it's probably just more of the same where it's a faster way, faster and more efficient way to get your non-distinct output that you're probably going to have anyways. And then those 15% of campaigns are still going to have their place in the market where like that's, they're the ones uh, pushing boundaries. They're the ones getting a lot of the attention probably. And you're just like, if you're in the 85% that's really indistinct, you're kind of giving a gift to the 15%. They're just like, well, you just stay in distinct 85% because we're crushing it over here. Yeah. And with and, uniqueness. But you know, and like, so I'm yeah, I'm a jazz musician, and and you know, as uh so it'd be, you know, like um I'm <laughs> the popular culture is not like, what do the jazz musicians have to say? Um, we I am over there in the corner doing my thing. Um, but I I I I remember thinking, wouldn't it be nice if everyone was artist? It wouldn't it be nice if everyone is creative. And then you're like, no, that would be psycho. You need to have a small group of people that are willing to bang their heads against a wall to, to I- increase things. But just imagine if you looked at a marketplace where everything was distinct, everything looked unique. You're talking about an unrealistic place because the mimetic influences that we have, which means w- what you have, I want. And that's just how we work. That's how we feel comfortable. Everyone's saying, you got to zag. Everybody's zigging, zag, zag, zag. Uh, I don't know. You know, and when you're trying to get a creative idea across to people and it's a little edgy or something, they are going to not be into that because they want safety in numbers. And two, The way we actually behave is that we are deeply influenced by others and we want to be accepted by them. So I think this idea of us just going, just going balls hard to the wall, we are so creative, we are so unique, is not realistic because no one will understand what you're doing. You know, there's like free free jazz, which is like just basically noise, noise rock, you know. I mean Glenn Branca, like any of those people, like he has a symphony which just is guitars and it's like 200 guitars. And it is the most insane stuff you've ever heard. I like it. It's good. John Zorn, really edgy stuff. But honestly, that's not for everybody. You actually yeah. have to be cool with not being for everybody in order to really punch through and be unique. And I don't know if a lot of marketers and advertisers are ready to do that and thank God you have advertising agencies pushing ideas, farming out ideas, you know, and hoping that they will get an outcome yeah. that's good for you through the outputs. But AI is all output and input. There, there is no focus on outcome. And so yeah. I think you have to be very considerate of the outcome and then you'll be able to make whatever you want with all this stuff. Well, 
<clears throat> yeah, I mean, you're making me think of something else here is, is like, so you take these, whatever, and I'm just going to stick with your statistic that, uh, that that you threw out there that you, you it's or I. It's true. I read who, it on the internet, who, Miles. You, you read it on the internet. But 80, let's say 85% of campaigns are, are non-distinct. Right. And let's say that, you know, popular music, geez, 99.999% nine percent of it is non-distinct it's it's a very <laughs> you're talking now you're talking about a real whatever ecosystem a body of work that is very indistinct right but you think about well take a song or a movie what is it that most of the time people want out of the song or the movie they want to feel they want to feel something mm-hmm. and they usually, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I, I'm the same way. We're all the same way. We want to yeah. feel something that we want to feel it in the way we want to feel it. We want to know that it's coming. We want, we want verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. We want that because that's actually the f- structure of the song that we're anticipating that we're the anticipation is like a lot of the source of our enjoyment. And so when yeah. when artists break out of that, if, when you creatively break out of the formulas, most of the time, to your point, people are not going to enjoy it because they're like, well, that wasn't what I was expecting. That mm. was a song structure I wasn't expecting. Mm. That was a, a plot structure I wasn't expecting. That movie just ended in the middle of a scene. I wasn't expecting any of that. I mm. wanted the happy ending. Mm. I wanted people to ride off into the sunset. That was going to be the most emotionally gratifying way for that creative work to kind of unfold before me. Right. And so advertising is a lot of it probably works the exact same way. I mean, you, you said yourself, I think you said something about m- m- memetics yeah. memes. Like there's this language that we just expect to see. And that's the most emotionally gratifying thing in most cases. And so it's like, okay, everybody's using the same font. Everybody's using similar color palettes, blah, 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 blah. We just, a lot of, a lot of like our, the gratification we get from like creative works that we see or hear or consume or whatever is because they're formulaic and the formula is actually ends up being part of its strength ironically enough and and that's where i think marketers and advertisers are particularly at a loss because in music what you're talking about those those form song form structures you know that was laid down 200 300 years ago Exactly. You know, like you ain't doing nothing that Beethoven didn't do. You're not doing anything that Mozart didn't do. You know, one to five, get a four in there, you know, tension release. It's all good. Yes. You know, you're nothing new under the sun. But what my take has been in every regard is that you have to do something different with cliche. That's your main yep. remit. You don't have to create a brand new thing. If you think you are creating a brand new thing, you have a level of hubrosity that I cannot compete with. Because, oh, this is a new idea. This is something they've never seen before. Okay, you're so full of it. But the main job is to do something different with cliche. Don't feel yeah. bad about cliche. It's the relational right. vehicle that you can tunnel through to that feeling of familiarity. And then you yeah. tweak it just a little bit. And then yeah. you're done. Don't think yeah. that you're going to do something brand new. And AI yeah. would, would end up maybe creating something that we haven't ever seen before. Yeah. You know, and you're like, well, that's not actually what we want, man. You know, yeah, like, that's not what's going to affect people. Well, it's it's also I mean, I, I, so I, I like so. OK, so the way that you kind of get into people's brains is through cliche. And so yes. these AIs are not actually intelligent, like, you know, they're makers, except for the people who really go out on a limb and say that they these things actually are intelligent. Most people agree that they're not. I don't think no. they are. No. Is that is they won't figure that out. They won't figure out that link between, because they don't, if an AI doesn't feel emotional satisfaction, then it doesn't know where the emotive, emotional satisfaction or gratification derives from, from a creative output. So it'll never right. understand why a creative output is emotionally satisfying because it does not feel emotions. And so from there, it can then not tweak the cliche because it never understood what the cliche was in the first place. And so it's definitely, I, you know, I I think you've actually kind of drawn out of this conversation, kind of a really interesting wall that AI creative output is going to, is going to run into like 
really fast is like, well, if, if the AI doesn't, doesn't experience emotional gratification, then it will never be able to identify it. And if it can't identify it, then it certainly can't play with it or tweak it or, you know, be, be creative with it, you know, to get back to just the, the sheer concept of creativity. Yeah. And, and I mean, this, this all goes into my, you know, hypothesis that creativity is not considered serious thinking. When anybody's like, let's get creative. It, but they're meaning I don't have money. That's what that means. Let's get creative. Uh, oh, do I get paid? No. Um, but if I'm, if I'm at McKinsey, if I'm a consulting agency, that's serious thought. Those are right. serious thinkers over there. And if there's numbers involved, serious thought. Creativity is not considered a serious mode of thinking. And that's why we're so happy that AI is here to help us reduce agency costs, you know, all yes. those things. And like, did I really have to pay for you to pitch this? Did I really have to pay for you to like come up with different campaigns when I can just have this thing run thousands of iterations of what's successful AZ test? And then I'll come out with something that it says is good. I'm going to go with it. If it doesn't work, I really don't have to blame a human. I can just blame the prompts or, you know, the data sets or something like that. But someone will still get the scapegoat. But now it doesn't have to be this clown yeah. who has a music degree, you know, like, why were we listening to that fool? Um, so I, I think that's really interesting is, is creativity is not considered serious thought. And that's happening in advertising, marketing, business, wherever. And yeah. if you want to get creative, don't do it on the tactical end. Get creative on the strategic end. Come from an original place. Understand your, your forms and functions and your, your limitations and focus in on lean offerings that you can kill at and then germinate your ideas from there. And you just have a tighter seed pod to grow a tree that's going to get tall enough to give you yeah. shade in the future. But I mean, here I am lost in a metaphor and this is probably the reason why people don't want me to talk too much because I, boy. No, no. It's just, no, this is actually, this has been very enlightening. This oh my is why God. I wanted, We're going this hard is, on this one. No, this is why I wanted to talk to you in particular about this is it, I, there's actually been several epiphanies that I have had on this podcast. So thank you. But I, all I was going to sort of finish with yes. is, you know, I, I like to think that, or basically essentially assume that there's silver linings everywhere with all this AI stuff with respect to creativity. And you actually called out, I think potentially an interesting one is there was always this sort of like a uh, large set of, let's say, you know, clients who wanted quote unquote creativity. Right. But to your point that it wasn't, that wasn't what they wanted. And, and oftentimes they don't want to pay for creativity. And so now they have machines to do that for them. So the, the people who are creative are like, well, now I kind of can take a lot of noise out of my world because all the mm -hmm. people who wanted to talk to me about creativity but didn't really want it and didn't certainly didn't want to pay for it mm -hmm. i no longer have to talk to them because they're using ais now and now i can just focus my time on the clients who really do want to be creative and so that that honestly could be a silver lining because these that. ai tools are giving clients marketers whatever it is a shortcut to the thing they always wanted anyways was cheap vanilla chum <laughs> And the AI will give that to you all day long. All day long, at, baby. At, at no additional cost. <laughs> it, yes. It'll, it, yeah. I'm loving that. So let's pivot because we, we are running out of time. Let's, let, I, I want to get your, back to ad tech. Um, I want to get a horror story from you and then a Cinderella story. Something that went great. Uh, when you were interfacing in this industry that you're working with and you have so much experience. So can you kind of just quickly give me like a horror story where things just went so bad and you don't have to name names, um, but then also uh, kind of pair that with yeah. something that really like just was zinging and you were like, okay, yeah. ad tech. I, <clears throat> I would not characterize it as a horror story, but my ad tech founder days, I ended up running my ad tech platform single-handedly from about 2013 to 2017. Uh, so I was running an entire ad tech company literally single-handedly. I wasn't even like farming stuff out to like an offshore, you know, developer team or anything like that. 
And that was on the one hand, very, very enlightening. And a lot of what I know about ad tech and, and sort of being able to conceive of its inner workings sort of viscerally comes from that experience of having scratch built a whole ad tech sort of platform myself. But um, on the other hand, that sucked. That just sucked. <laughs> like, especially yeah. pick, especially picking a type of platform that has to have like, you know, 24 7 365 uptime an ad server you right. can't ever yeah. go down you can't right. it can never go offline hmm. uh, uh was very stressful uh you know there were a couple times when you know it it quite literally just blew up and melted down before my eyes and i had to you know just sit there until i could rebuild the thing and and, and get it back online and so that 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 was really sort of like if you want to talk about a uh, sort of a nightmare scenario in my career, that was kind of it. Like I said, it was yeah. not really a, a nightmare that makes it seem like it was a 24 hour a day, just like cluster, which it, it, it really wasn't. Um, right. um, but it's something I certainly won't ever do again. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have an AI. Unless I have an AI. Yeah. No. Well, then that's what everybody's saying about these AIs that, you know, now these, you know, companies of as small as one are going to be able to launch incredible software products. I, and I fully believe that. I That was one of the biggest eye-opening things for me of like uh, stepping outside of myself. And so this was with really the benefit of um, uh, cloud computing. With I, I was oh, for, yeah. personally, I was, I, I was using Amazon Web Services. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow, one schmuck with an internet connection and a credit card to have an Amazon Web Services account can build an entire ad tech company single-handedly. Yeah. What does this really say about, certainly about ad tech as a category, and how sure. differentiated ad tech could possibly be in this day and age if literally one person can build an entire ad tech platform single-handedly? What does that really say about how specialized that ad tech category or that technology category is? But now with AI, it's it's almost all software is under that i don't know what you want to if you want to call it a threat but i hesitate to say that it's just it's it, all software is now under this umbrella of like you realize now any schmuck anywhere in the world i mean anywhere it used to be like oh they're going to be in silicon valley and blah 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 blah, blah. right but well, like now you like literally anybody in the world who's reasonably good at quote unquote prompt engineering uh can build something of incredible sophistication uh well, I, anyway i just it's it's fascinating to think about so and then and then do you think that's sort of the pair is is there sort of this there's a horror story uh you know of being inundated with just yeah. you know one but then <laughs> the cinderella story is that one person can do all these things i mean is that or or do you have another kind of I, instance of ad tech going great my, my my instance of ad tech going great is um, uh, really all about U of Digital, and um, I guess that that's sort of like one of the happy endings. The, the the Cinderella story part of it is okay. So it's like there's there's the there's the blood, sweat, and toil of like building and running this ad tech platform single handedly, which was incredibly difficult and stressful. But now, you know, I sort of find myself with um, you know a really like strong power of explanation for ex- explaining this to other people yeah. and uh they really get a lot of enjoyment out of that and i get a lot of enjoyment out of them getting enjoyment out of it and so yeah. uh that is very fun because i'm now in a position where we get to explain things to people uh you know all day every day and watch these people and sort of help people have these light bulb moments and um that really is how it happens. You know, we'll be on a live workshop and people will just like drop comments into the chat of like, I never thought of it this way. Thank you. I've never like, this is a great slide. I just like, I get it. I'm having a light bulb moment. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, and so anyway, that's, that's my feel good story about what I, what I get to do all day. And it made me think, and God, we're just so over time, but I don't care. Um, the fact, if you really want to learn something, teach it. Because then you, uh, you have all these questions. Like I worked at the Museum of Nature and Science, and you know, I taught kids, and I dressed up as a bee to show them like fluid dynamics in, in air and 
um, you know, all those fun things like learned about bears hibernating and I dressed up as a mama bear and all the kids were baby bears and oh my God, that job was great. But in teaching people, I learned yep. so much. And maybe, maybe one of the things that you're imparting to the audience is like, ad tech's complicated, AI's coming. There's all these possibilities that have been here. They're, they're manifesting in new ways. Your main goal, marketer out there listening to us, is find a way to teach your, your, the, the shareholders, your teammates, you know, yep. share knowledge, and then you gain knowledge and experience. And maybe do you think, I mean, I'm kind of jumping the gun, but like the one piece of advice for the audience about ad tech um, is it, is it related to that learning and, uh, experiencing, or, I mean, like, what, what, what do you think if you had to boil it all down, what, what do you think well, your one piece of advice would be? Uh, uh, honestly, yes. If you, if you can explain it to other people and teach it, uh, and I mean, a lot of companies use this as an internal teaching tool is like, you pick one person out of the group who has to learn the topic and then teach it to everybody else. I mean, that's sort of a classic, like organizational training, sure. education technique. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, that works. Um, I mean, I think also uh, try to keep a bird's eye view on what's going on. It, it, like if, if, if I could pick sort of one way to recommend how to like understand I'm um, using air quotes here for everybody who can't see, uh, yeah. understand what's going on in ad tech is, is that the answers that you seek are likely not in the weeds. They're not in the 11,000 company MarTech landscape. It, it has more to do with understanding the dynamics for why did those companies come to exist? Why are there 11,000 of them? Uh, uh, you know, which ones came first that gave rise to the next ones that gave rise to the next ones? And understanding, uh, uh, sort of having a bird's eye view of under understanding of it uh, will then allow you to pretty quickly and easily understand the minutia because the minutia follows usually pretty predictable patterns if you have the bird's eye view. Uh, dude, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, I, I'm telling everybody, get amongst Miles. Get Find him on LinkedIn, Twitter, all that stuff. If people want to connect with you and learn more about you, how can they do that, Miles? Uh, so go to uof.digital, uof.digital to learn about U of Digital. Yeah, I'm all over LinkedIn. I'm Miles underscore younger on, on Twitter. Um, those are all the three kind of best ways to, uh, uh, to find me. Cheese or chocolate? Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Cheese or chocolate? Chocolate. Hmm. Stones or beetles? Stones. Okay. Beastie Boys or Beach Boys? Oh, I uh, Beach Boys. Right? Tapioca, yay or nay? Yay. Oh, you're just crazy, bro. Uh, time machine. Are you going to go forward or are you going to go backward? Backward. And finally, early riser or late night owl? Oh, early riser. Totally. And I should have said early bird. I messed up. I don't know. I, it's a groggy bird. A <laughs> Drink more coffee, Miles. <laughs> what Gets Measured is a Ninja Cat podcast. Please rate and review the show wherever you find your podcasts. Share this episode on social and visit us on the web at ninjacat.io.